If you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab them and turn to John chapter 10. We're continuing in our I Am series, looking at the I Am statements of Jesus in the Gospel of John. As you're turning over there, I want to make you aware, you may not be aware of this. Uh, this week, we will have some construction start uh, in our restrooms and lounge areas. And so for the next few Sundays, those areas will be off limits. We are enlarging both uh, bathrooms to be able to accommodate anyone who has a, uh, a handicap or a special need. Uh, and so it'll you know be a, be a process. And we're also installing a ramp off of the front of our church to, to better accommodate. And so that just takes up some time. And uh, so we got that going. And if you've uh, never been to the restroom here at Brookwood, uh, I'll let you know that uh, there are some restrooms behind us. You can go out either one of these two doors and turn towards the middle and you'll see the signage there. And so I'm not sure you're aware of that. And if you come in next week and, uh, you know, and you need a restroom, didn't want you to be, uh, felt like you were, uh, you know, going to be an issue. So, you know, construction starting reminds me that I need to brag on my wife. Uh, my wife, she's back uh, rocking babies right now. And so something miraculous happened yesterday. Uh, my wife, uh, me and my wife, we took down uh, a light, a lighted ceiling fan in our kitchen uh, together. Uh, we went to Lowe's together and picked out a new light. We installed the new light. Uh, and then I did not like the new light and we took it down again. Uh, I went to Lowe's and picked one without her being present. We installed the new one. And last night when she tucked me into bed, she smiled and said she loved me. And she felt the same way when we woke up in the morning. And so God, my wife is truly a good woman. And so you know that can be very trying. I'm sure you've thought this before. It can be very trying to be married to me. But my wife does a great, great job with it. And so... uh, I actually told that story to my dad. I said, we, we took, a, we took a, a light down and put it up two different times today, and we're still smiling at each other. And he said, well, you've, you've done something. It's been a good day. And so, um, but you know, when God looks at our, uh, when God looks at the world, there's a lot of, the Bible gives us a lot of uh, imagery there, a lot of understanding of what he's thinking and, and how he's feeling. But one in particular stands out to me. It may be just the nature of, of my job. He looks at the world as a shepherd. And he sees his sheep uh, and the state of his sheep and the life of his sheep. He sees the world and its enemies and all those sorts of things. But when we think about God, I'm not sure we focus enough on the fact that God is a shepherd to us. And today we look at Jesus when he says, I am the good shepherd. We're going to be in John chapter 10. And I want us to understand this as we, as we learn and, and hear from God's word this morning. And as we leave from here that we can trust Jesus as the good shepherd because he laid his life down for us and brought us into his flock. We can trust Jesus as the good shepherd because he laid his life down for us and he brought us into his flock. And so picking up on what we talked about last week, he using the imagery of sheep, uh, and when Jesus presented himself as the door of the sheep, meaning that he was the way in which sheep could legitimately and authentically leave the sheep pen and find good pasture. Uh, it was his example, his way that helps us to understand that. He shifts now in the same conversation, the same sort of statements to talk about himself as the good shepherd. Of the two I am statements in this passage, today's gets a lot more press because it's a little bit easier to understand even though we may not have any experience with sheep. And listen to what verse 11 says, I am the good shepherd The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay my life down for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father." And so at the end of the day, we all have to answer the same question when we read passages like this. How do we know 
that Jesus is good? How do we know without a shadow of a doubt that he can be trusted, that he will live up to his words, that he will fulfill our understanding of what it means to be good or the Bible's understanding of what it means to be good? How do you know that he cares about you? You may be living in a a season of life that you feel like he doesn't care about you. How can you trust that God can care about you better than you can care about yourself or someone else can care about you? That he won't abandon you or that he won't mistreat you. You see, when we look at it through the lens of sheep and understand God's role as shepherd, we have these questions. To not ask these questions, I really don't think, is to be genuinely living in the world that we live in. From time to time, we all question whether or not God is good. We all question whether or not God cares for us, that he will continue to care for us, and that in the greatest things in our life, death and the smallest things of our life, the many things that fill our lives, that he can genuinely care for us and do something about it. Because our, if we're honest, our experience in life has taught us to have trust issues. Has our experience not taught us to have trust issues? It's been our experience maybe in our marriage or in our family to trust, to not trust someone. It's certainly in the realm of our politics today to not have trust for our political leaders or our government. We have trust issues at work, whether or not our boss or the organization that we work at has our best interest that truly cares for us, that when someone uh, younger or someone more efficient comes along, that they won't replace us. And unfortunately, that's been the case for us in church. We have trust issues in the church, those who are supposed to protect us, those who are supposed to have our best interest at heart. Those who are supposed to be selfless and sacrificial often end up wounding and abusing the very people they're supposed to be helping. For many of us, we feel, whether it's right or not, that we're better off alone trusting ourselves than trusting someone else or another leader. In your mind right now, whether whatever it is that you, you're having a tough time trusting someone who's in maybe a, a position of leadership in your life, uh, I know many people who this is not an issue for them at all and praise Jesus for them, but many others who if they have one or two more letdowns in the area of leadership in their life, that they're really going to suffer for that maybe for the rest of their life. That if they have one more letdown in their life, it could be their marriage, it could be in their family, it could be uh, in a workplace. It certainly feels like politically, if we have one more bad leader come through that lets us down and takes advantage of us uh, and, and all the alike, that we're just done with it. All right, And being done with it uh, might just mean that we no longer vote, we no longer cut on the news, we just hunker down and we don't care one way or the other because we're tired of putting our energy into it. And yet, is that really the best way to respond? On the other hand, God has always provided shepherds for his people. If we read the stories of the Old Testament and the New, figuratively speaking, God has always provided for his people. I love that he uses the imagery of shepherd from the very beginning. I mean, from early in the book of Genesis, we know about shepherds. We know that the people of God were shepherds. We know that the world looked down on shepherds. But we know the sort of work that shepherds used to do. We know that that carried throughout their life that David, King David, the greatest king in the history of Israel, was once a shepherd. We know uh, that there were many shepherds. That some of the first to see and hear about the good news of Jesus Christ were shepherds. And so this imagery is rich in the Bible, even though it may not be rich for us here today. Uh, I remember in seminary, a pastor, famous pastor, probably top two, top three downloaded pastors uh, on iTunes or that, that shows you how long it's, I've been listening to a sermon. So there may be another platform that people download stuff to, but it used to be iTunes. And so uh, he said, I don't like using the shepherd imagery because I don't know what that means. And I'm, I'm in seminary and I'm like, well, well you're, you're, you teach the Bible. Figure out what it means and teach that to your people. Because whether we like it or not, and I'm talking about leaders in the church, pastors and elders, uh, whether we like it or not, the, the image is a shepherd. And so that's what God does for his people. He shepherds them. I'm not a cowboy. All right, I'm not a boss, I'm not a manager, I'm not any of those other images. At the end of the day, your pastors of your church are shepherds first and foremost. And Peter tells us that they shepherd in a way that they should know that one day they're going to give an account to the one chief shepherd who comes to see how they have treated their flock. 
And so shepherding is such a huge image in the Bible. And we should understand that it is one of the primary ways that God desires to relate to us. And so when Jesus uses the image of good shepherd, there's a lot going on in that phrase. And always as we come to God's word, we need to understand what it meant to them before we try to understand what it means to us. And so John was writing specifically to people a message. And it's our job to listen with the same faith and the same intent to hear that message and apply it to us today. And so while we may, and I'll say this again, we may, most of us, maybe a handful in here differently, not live in the world of shepherds and sheep and animals and things like that, that doesn't mean that the lesson that was for them then is not the same lesson for us today. And so to understand better what it means to be a good shepherd, we have to read some from the Old Testament. And we're going to look in Ezekiel chapter 34. When I say you don't have to turn your Bibles there because the scripture is not going to be on the screen. Um, Ezekiel 34, this is a book of prophecy. And so Ezekiel is speaking on behalf of God to the people of God. But in this particular chapter, chapter 34, and you may want to write that on your bulletin to look at later. Uh, Ezekiel has a very strong word for the shepherds of Israel. And so God is, is really upset with the shepherds of Israel at this point. And he says that he's, going, he's seen what they've done and he's going to judge them. And he, is going, he, he gives a promise of what he is going to do for his sheep. And so if we start with the problem in, in the first couple of verses of chapter 34, God says to these shepherds, he says, they have taken advantage of the sheep. They've not cared for them as they should have. They've not, they've not strengthened the weak. They've not healed the sick. They've not bound up the injured. They've not brought back those who are straying and they've not sought after those who are lost. They have failed at caring for those entrusted to their leadership. And so if you think about it spiritually speaking and you think about it literally speaking that God would provide shepherds for his people and he was angry at a lot of things in the book of Ezekiel but he's, he's really angry that the leaders have not led in the way that they were, give, that, that they were uh, called to lead and so they're not shepherding the sheep. In fact, they were, they were uh, getting fat on the sheep. They were clothing themselves with the sheep. And so you know what that means, right? So um, they didn't go to other flocks to find their fat. And they didn't go to other flocks to find their clothes. They were taking that from them their own. And so it'd be one thing if they were just robbing other flocks and, you know, taking care of their sheep. But they're not taking care of their sheep and they're, they're benefiting from that. And so you see that God has a right to be angry at them. Because these are not just any sheep, there are his sheep. And God issues a judgment. One of, the, one of the most intimidating ones, he says, I am against the shepherd and I will require my sheep at their hand and I will stop them. Okay, so, so as prophecy goes, um, there are a few things that you don't want to be read your way from God. You don't want God to be against you. You don't want God to uh, stop you. You don't want God to hold you accountable for something that you should have been doing. And so you see, if you were to walk up on this conversation, you see that God is, is clearly the aggressor in this conversation. He's clearly the judge. This is, this is not a conversation back and forth. This is a one-way conversation. And so God is angry at them for not doing what they were supposed to do and taking advantage of his sheep. And not only is he just angry at them and he's going to punish them, but he's going to punish them in some specific ways. And then God promises, as he does, that not only is there a problem and a judgment, but he adds this promise that he's going to provide a shepherd. But listen to what he says. He says, I will search and seek them out. I will rescue them. I will bring them from the nations and guide them into the promised land. And I will feed them with good pasture and make them lie down. I myself will be their shepherd, be the shepherd of my people. And in verse 23, he says, And I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. And so God makes this promise that takes a few hundred years to be fulfilled. That he sees and notices that his sheep are not being taken care of. That he has intent to punish those who are responsible for not taking care of them. And that he himself will fix it. He will fix it and care for them and he will appoint one for them who will take care of them in the fullest sense. And it's all 
working together. At the end of chapter 34, he says to the people of God, you are the human sheep of my flock. And so when you think about God, or whatever it is you think you know about God, the God of the Bible says to us that we are sheep of his flock, that he cares for us, and that it angers him more than it angers you when his shepherds don't care for his people the way they ought to. And I'm not just talking about those in the church, those pastors who ought to care for them. Do you not realize that we have multiple people who are caring for us and yet taking advantage of us? That we have multiple people in our life, whether it's in our families or in our workplaces or in our government, in our neighborhoods, in the church, outside the church, who have a position of authority and leadership in your life that is supposed to be caring for you, but is not. And that makes us angry. And it would make us hopeless if it were not for the words of Christ. And so every Jew in the crowd would have been on the lookout for the one shepherd who comes to rescue his sheep. Even the slack ones, even the slack Israelites in this crowd would know when he said, I am the good shepherd, that he was hearkening back to a prophecy that had yet to be fulfilled. And so when he says, I am the good shepherd, he is the fulfillment of the promises that God made through the prophet of Ezekiel and are now coming to pass. And so it should be no surprise to us that they wanted to kill him Because Jesus was saying to them, I am God. I'm the one who's going to care for you. I'm the one who's going to shepherd you. And all of what that word means. It's a stark contrast to the way that Jesus shepherds and that of the hired hand. The hired hand, the sheep aren't his. So when he sees the wolf, he flees. And instead of saving the sheep, he runs. Jesus promises to lay his life down for the sheep. The wolf is the enemy of the sheep. Really all sheep, but especially Jesus' sheep. And so let me, let me talk about this for a second. Hired hands don't, by definition, have any ownership or relational context to the sheep that they're caring for. Okay? So when it goes, starts to go bad... It's just a job. It's just a job. All right, you've prob- if you've worked any time in your life, you have worked with people like this. If you've owned a business or run a company, you know these type of workers. All right? As long as you pay them to do the job, they'll do the job. But if you need them to do anything extra or you need them to take some personal ownership, they're not going to do that because it's just a job. And so... That's what Jesus is saying. You have hired hands who care for the sheep, but if trouble happens, they're going to leave. I mean, they're going to they'll probably leave, leave the gate open uh, so that the, the wolf is consumed with the sheep and not consumed with them. I like to watch a lot of movies, and there's that movie, 13 Hours in Benghazi. And so there's a moment in that movie in which the aggressors in there, uh, it gets too hot and heavy. And so all the hired protection and security forces lay their guns down and leave. This is what Jesus is describing. They're not going to protect you because they have no reason to protect you. But Jesus is not like that. Jesus is not like that at all. He will lay his life down. And and understand, he's not saying he loves you so much and he's so committed to the process that he's going to do whatever it is that you need him to do. And by the way, if it cost him his life, he will not give up on you. We think about heroes in that sense. that, That they're going to do the work And if it requires their life, they will do that as well. This is why we love uh, our military. This is why we love our first responders. This is why we have, we love the stories of heroes who do what the job is necessary, especially when they have to sacrifice themselves for someone else. That's not the direction that this went. Jesus does handle all the day-to-day operations of your life and my life, but he knows it's going to cost him his life. There is no question of not whether or not Jesus can figure this out and it not cost him his life. He knows it is going to cost him at a basis his life. And he willingly lays down his life. He knows what the wolf is after and he's ready to pay, pay for it all. You may think, why does it matter 
and, and, and of all the things that Jesus can do for you, and he can do a lot. All right, don't come to Jesus because he can do a lot of things for you, all right? I'm, I'm going to give you some pastoral encouragement. You can come to faith this morning and you may lose more money than you had last year. You may lose someone close to you. You may get sick. You may lose your job. There's a lot of trials and tribulations that come after the fact. All right, so don't come to Jesus because he can check all the boxes off, all right? You come to Jesus because he lays his life down for you, which means everything else that happens after that is not that big a deal. So, so understand that, but why does it matter that Jesus lays his life down for us? And, and we may not be able to understand this, and I'm certainly limited as a preacher, and so I want to read to you a, a passage of a story uh, that me and my children love to read. And so if you're a parent and uh, looking for something to read with your kids, I would uh, recommend the Chronicles of Narnia. And so the Chronicles of Narnia is a fictional uh, writing. I think it's fictional. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm just checking to see if you guys are paying attention. Um, it's a fictional story uh, about uh, Aslan, a king. Uh, he's a lion. And so uh, he lives in a world, Narnia, that he created. And these children, all throughout these books, go and visit with Aslan. They meet him. They're introduced with him. And so it's different uh, family members, different kids, different children in Narnia. And what they experience in Narnia uh, helps them understand and know who Aslan is so that they get back to the real world. They will know Aslan as a different name. Aslan is Jesus in the story. And so in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, which I think is the second book, we have uh, four children, Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy. They're brothers and sisters. And so they find an access point to this Narnia through, uh, I think, their uncle's wardrobe. And so they, they get in there and they get in all kinds of mess. But Edmund, on the real side, is struggling with his place in his family. And he uh, is always looking to be in charge and have influence. And so when they get over into Narnia, he unfortunately betrays his family. And he tra he's a traitor to them. And so there's this story about him being pursued uh, by the witch and being pursued by Aslan. And there's this coming battle. And so Aslan and the witch have gotten together so that Edmund does not have to lose his life. And they've made a deal. And so no one knows what the deal is about. If you know the story, you know what it's about. They don't know what the, deal, the terms of the deal are. But we're picking up the story right at the uh, climax of this point of the story. And it says that Lucy and Susan watched as hundreds of monstrous creatures surround Aslan and the stone table. These are horrible creatures from mythology and the darkest realms of the imagination at the center of these awful creatures is the witch. The witch expects Aslan's arrival and she tells her servants to tie him up. At first, the servants are hesitant, but when Aslan does not resist, they are thrilled to oblige. The witch's servants humiliate Aslan further by shaving off his mane, muzzling him, kicking him, and jeering at him. Aslan does not protest. The servants finish binding Aslan to the stone table and the witch approaches him with her stone knife. The witch tells Aslan that he is lost. The witch says she will kill Aslan instead of Edmund as they agreed. This sacrifice will appease the deep magic. The witch, however, explains that once Aslan is dead, there will be nothing to prevent her from killing Edmund as well as the other three children. Once Aslan is gone, the witch will be queen of Narnia forever. Lucy and Susan cover their eyes so they do not see the witch murder Aslan. Later in the story, eventually Susan and Lucy return to Aslan's body and they see mice scampering over him. Susan raises a hand to scare them away when Lucy notices that they are actually nibbling at the cords and trying to untie him. The mice leave as dawn arrives and Susan and Lucy walk around aimlessly as the sky brightens. The girls look at Care Parviel, Paravel, when the first ray of gold breaks over the horizon. At that moment, Lucy and Susan hear a deafening crack. They whirl around to see the stone table has broken in half, and Aslan has disappeared. Lucy asks if this, more, this is more magic, and a voice behind her answers that it is indeed more magic. Su Man. Susan and Lucy whirl around again and see Aslan alive. Susan and Lucy rush to Aslan and Susan asks him if he is a ghost. 
Aslan alleviates her fears with one warm breath to answer their questions. Aslan explains that the witch was right, that the deep magic has decreed that all traitors' lives are forfeited to the witch. If the witch had looked back before the dawn of time, she would have learned that when a willing innocent victim is killed by a traitor, the stone table will crack and death will be reversed. It matters that Jesus lays his life down for us. There are things in your life that you need that you are unable to provide for yourself. And when the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep, the wrath of God is satisfied. Redemption has been paid. Forgiveness has been secured. A perfect sacrifice has been offered. And a hired hand could never do this for you or for me. Are our hired hands any better for us today? Are our needs any less? To those in our midst that are weak, to those in our midst that are wandering, that are lost, that are injured, I would say to you this morning, come to the good shepherd of your soul. You're desperately searching for it. You desperately need it. And only Jesus can provide it to you. We can trust Jesus as the good shepherd because he laid his life down for us and brought us into his flock. You know, it's the nature of the wolf to scatter the sheep. Disunity among the flock is the byproduct of the wolf, not of Jesus. My very first sermon here as your pastor was about unity. It's a regular prayer request of ours. It's something that we celebrate here. It's something that is important. Because disunity is the work of the wolf. Unity in the midst of differences is the work of the Spirit of God and of Jesus Christ. And so there are some factors going on in the world right now that seek to destroy us, to cause disunity in the church, to divide us. They're political divisions. There's a misunderstanding in the church and outside of the church right now about a topic called social justice that is neither social nor just. It is Micah 6.8 that tells us what God requires of us. To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. It is God's word that informs us how we ought to treat the least of these in our world. It is not the world's idea. It is not perfecting the idea. And yet we're distracted for a host of reasons about social justice. And so it begins to divide. And churches are divided about how they'll talk about it, how they'll address it, who's saying what and who's doing what. And yet, we must maintain that it is the wolf that comes into the church to divide us over these issues. It has always been the heart of the shepherd to guide us in unity to the pasture. So that doesn't mean that we turn a deaf ear or a blind eye to injustice in our world. But don't, don't, church, let's not get so easily distracted from the things that have always been on God's heart and are done according to God's will. The world is not interested in justice. Certainly not in a manner that God is. There's this other faction I see kind of going on in the world in which the the wolf offers us an ulterior idea to a God who creates us in His image, who creates us male and female, that establishes marriage for His purpose and for His good. The wolf offers us Marriage and sexuality and gender that is fluid and can do anything that it wants and accomplish anything that it desires. And yet it destroys the image of God in each of us and replaces it with an idol formed after its own image. The wolf offers us lies that will destroy us and leave us scattered. Only Jesus offers us true abundant life in the Father's world. The church today is surrounded by wolves. But that's always been the case. There's never been a time that the church has existed 
when she was not surrounded by wolves. Don't don't fear the wolf. Trust the shepherd. Don't put your gaze on what's going out on out, out there or what's going on maybe in our own hearts and the, the things that are creeping in. If if our eyes and our focus will be on the good shepherd, then we will make it to the good pasture. And, and that's another thing that I'd like to point out. The first one was that the wolf is his his primary work is to spread disunity in the flock, and then destroy us. Secondly, Jesus has sheep that are not of this fold. Do you understand that that Jesus has sheep that are not of this fold? So when he says that to a group of Jewish people, he's thinking about you included in that. If this good news is only good news to Jews then there's a lot of people who will be left out. And yet God has a plan that encompasses all nations and all peoples. I think sometimes in church life we can get a little bit of tunnel vision thinking that the people that we, are, we like, and we're, that not only do we like them, but we are like them, that, that this is what it, the kingdom of heaven looks like. And we fail to realize that God has all sorts of people that he wants to save through the good news of Jesus Christ. They're, they're actually sheep of his flock and they're, they're going to know one day that he is the good shepherd. And I guess what I'm arguing and, and, and pleading with us as a, as a shepherd here is that we always leave the gate open. That we always are leaving this flock to go and spread the good news. And when we find these sheep, that we welcome them into this flock, not to be like us, but be, to be like the shepherd. And so don't get such a small view of God that it limits in who He can reach. There are people all over the world that don't look like you or talk like you or think like you right now. And yet they are sheep of His fold. And God expects the sheep who are currently in His fold to be hospitable and loving and kind and welcoming to those who are yet in this fold. And so when we see this, he's not just a good shepherd for us, he's a good shepherd for all of those who will trust him. I think in sermon series like this, there's some of this that is discovering it for the first time, and some of it is rediscovering it again, that Jesus is a good shepherd. That he, has, that he has, he was willing to do and has laid his life down for us. And that means that's incomparable. There's nothing else he could do for you that could express his love for you and his care for you and his desire to take care of you than him willingly laying down his life. But all those other things are important too. That's why I want us to have a moment. And we, we, we normally do this in a different part of our time, I just, you know, kind of feel burdened about the stories that I know and hear. There's, and our congregation is growing, and so the the amount of stories like this are growing. And it's certainly more than I can bear, but it's not more than he can bear. And so as we transition here in a second to pray, to get ready to sing and respond, I want to offer you who are, who are weak, who are weary, who are distracted, who are wandering, an opportunity to stand for yourself or on behalf of someone else so that the Good Shepherd will care for you in the way that the Good Shepherd has promised to care for you. Whether that's a physical or mental or emotional issue right now, whether that's a relational issue, whatever the issue is, Jesus didn't just die for you. He promises to be the Good Shepherd who takes you from one point to The end of all points. I think we need to know that. I think we need to be reminded of that. So that we can live our lives with trust in Him. And so whether you're here this morning and you don't know Christ and you want to know Christ. Or you're here this morning and you know Christ but you may have forgotten the power of the image of a good shepherd. He invites us all to trust that He is the Good Shepherd. And I want us to do that now. So if you'll bow your heads with me. And if you would like to stand on behalf of yourself or someone else, that God might shepherd your heart 
in the fullest way that he has promised to do. You stand now as we pray. God, I thank you for this image. I thank you for the story that has supplied us with such great stories in our faith. The story of a God who loves us despite what we have done, what we are doing and what we will do. That he has cared for us in ways that we are will never be able this side of heaven to grasp. And yet you call us to, to trust and believe in this. God, I thank you that you are a good shepherd. That hundreds of years ago, you put in the heart of a man to preach this promise that one day you will be our shepherd and we will be your sheep. That you yourself will care for us. And God, all over this room right now, men and women, young and old are standing. That they or someone else might know your presence, the presence of the shepherd in their life. God, we all are going through particular things right now and we need to be shepherded. We need to not be left to ourselves. We certainly don't need to be left to the hired hands of our day. We need the good shepherd to guide us, to care for us, to restrain us, to encourage us, to heal us, to find us, to search for us, God. And we find all of these in you. And they are fulfilled in you. And so God, I pray that this knowledge of the Good Shepherd might fill up in the minds of everyone in this, in this room here this morning. God, and I also pray that everyone who is standing, God, that they might feel in their heart, fill up with the hope that the Good Shepherd not only knows what they're going through, but has made a way. That he will not forsake them and not abandon them. And he will never leave. But he will be with them through it all, to the very end. And there will be an end one day for us all when we will pass from this life into the next. And God, I pray that you would shepherd all of our souls in this life and through this life and into the next. And God, I pray for those in this congregation right now who do not know the Good Shepherd, Lord, that whatever reason is preventing them from stepping out and making their faith known and trusting in the Lord. God, I pray that you might remove those obstacles and save them here this morning, God, and lead them to let us know all that you have done in their life. So God, let us, let us trust you because you are good, <coughs> because you have laid your life down for us, and because you have brought us into your flock. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Mm -hmm.